Ladies and gentlemen, we're currently in a little bit of a quiet phase in the chess world. It's currently February 26, 2024, and it's been about two weeks since we had any sort of massive drama, cheating accusations, people calling each other ugly, going at each other on social media, the standard protocol of a professional chess player. But one man has been busy, and that man is Grandmaster Hans Niemann the quote-unquote bad boy of chess, the most polarizing figure in the chess world. In a previous video, I called him a superstar. I got angry fan mail in my inbox saying that I shouldn't do that. Hans Niemann brings out emotions in folks, both positive and negative, that I've really never seen before. And for that reason, I'm going to cover his games, because love him or hate him, you're going to watch. Some of you are cheering him on, and some of you are rooting for his demise. And to those people, I would say, Crack open a window and get a little bit of fresh air. In today's video, I'm gonna be showing you a couple of games that Hans played in a recent tournament, and he always provides bangers. His games, win or lose, feature insane drama, plot twists, devastating attacks, unreal blunders. And uh, I'll be getting into uh, two of these games today. That's all I have for you. Let's, uh, let's move right along here. The first game that I have for you, I'm actually covering these games out of order. He was playing in a tournament called the Jerba Masters. Uh, Jerba is an island uh, off of uh, the coast of, I believe, Tunisia. And um, one of his opponents was Bilal uh, Belasenet. And Bilal is Algerian, but after this video, you should go Google Bilal and then Google Logic the Rapper. I've never seen two people who look more similar. In some images, Bilal literally looks like Logic the Rapper. So, Logic, open the game with e4. Hans played c5, the Sicilian defense, always confrontational, always looking for a fight. It's a perfect opening uh, for, uh, for Hans, but um, that came off a little bit more rude than I intended. I was not saying, it, you know what, it's just, it's a good opening to get in a fight, all right? And uh, Hans frequently plays e5 as well, he plays the Berlin. But he was clearly looking for a fight in this game. Knight f3, d6. So, you know, sometimes Hans likes to react to my video. So if, if Hans is watching this right now, uh, hi, I did not mean that uh, in such a, you know, he says, sometimes my mouth moves faster than my brain, I, you know, whatever. Anyway, Hans plays a Knight or Sicilian with d6, Knight f6, a6. And White now has many options, many, many, many options. Uh, bishop e3 and Bishop g5, not Bishop h5, uh, are the two main lines, but there are many other lines. Uh, Bilal does play the classical main line, and now Black has the option to play e6, to play e5, uh, or play knight bd7, uh, and that's kind of a little bit more of a of a of a, of a little bit more of a passive line. Uh, e5, then you can play uh, bishop e7, you can play bishop e6. Actually, e5 in particular is much more common against bishop to e3 setups, but in general, for like 99% of the audience, those are the three setups in the uh, knight orf. We have e6, queen f3. Applying pressure, obviously you want to castle long. Han says, take my knight, bozo. Uh, Bilal says, no thank you. I, I do not want to take your knight. I'm going to lower the volume of the P sounds. And then Hans plays e5. So, like I said, e6. Now e5, the knight's got to go somewhere. It does. And now Hans plays bishop g4. Rather than bishop to e6, this is the other comfortable situation and the comfortable uh, space for the bishop on the e6 square and then bishop to e7 as well. White in the knight orf likes to win control over the d5 square and apply pressure to the d6 pawn. Black decides what to do frequently based on what white is trying to do as well. Knight bd7. Now we have this. Now we have this. So this is the knight orf setup right here. Open c file for the rook. You got b5 and stuff. Uh, and now it's a question of which way you're going to castle. Here's long castle. Rook c8 is a possibility, as well as uh, sacrificing over here. So, for example, if white plays bishop e2, there's actually a very thematic Sicilian defense sacrifice, which is known as the rook sacrifice on c3. This would leave white with a damaged structure and a potentially open king, and then black would play b5, queen c7, and doesn't have to deliver mate right away. You'll notice there is no mate, but black is better. If white ever plays king b2, black will play knight b6. It's a very, very unpleasant position, actually, for white. I had a, a friend play a, uh, a tournament recently and get hit with one of these moves. He sort of fell asleep at the wheel a little bit, and uh, his opponent just went here and just demolished. I mean, like, black just won a really, really nice game. So you got to be really careful, which is why Bilal plays knight d5, says he can't take my, uh, he can't take my knight. 
Hans does this, targeting the pawn. Now white develops like this. And this is a very stable position. It's a very nice position, very solid. White will move the queen out of the way, start launching pawns. Black is a question of, you know, am I going to castle short? Am I going to keep my king in the center? Uh, yeah, Hans just decides, you know what? You want to attack me, buddy? You want to attack me while my king is in the center? You want to attack me and do something very principled? H5. What? Like, this is what I mean. Hans's games are so confrontational sometimes. His king's in the middle. White is doing everything right, trying to open up the position. Hans is just firing back at him with flank pawns. Look at this, rook f1, h4. How does this even make sense? Hans has five out of six pieces on the home, on the home rank, on the eighth rank. The fact that black's position is not completely lost doesn't make any sense. Queen h3, you, you can't guess Hans's next move. It's not possible. Like, if you don't understand the knight orf, or you don't understand uh, attacking in dynamic chess, you'll never guess the next move. All these pieces look like they suck. All of them. They, they, they look like none of them are doing anything. Like, if black slow plays and plays bishop g7, why is playing a five, bro? If black castles now, white's gonna play king b1, and then white's gonna open up the position, play queen e6. I mean, it, it's... Hans Neiman in this... Bro, he plays rook h5. He has now moved both... Rooks, you can't castle now. If you move your rooks, you can't castle. It's, it's not allowed. Did you know that? I, I don't know if you knew that. He continues to attack, does Bilal. But f5 is a mouse running into a trap. Instead of that, white had to, like, bring his knight that way. And then Hans would have went f5. I mean, this is nuts. And then white would have went here and we would have had an explosion. But you see, it's, it's balanced. The game is balanced. The fact that this is a balanced position is completely ridiculous. Rook h5. And now black gets caught. He gets caught. Uh-oh. And I don't know what his original follow-up was, but now he plays knight a5. And suddenly Hans trades everything. We're going straight to an endgame. Ain't nobody getting mated anymore. And now Hans, he, he, he's going to lose one of his pawns. He's going to lose. But no, no, he doesn't. He plays knight c5. And Bilal starts reconsidering, doesn't take the pawn back. Knight b7, we have take, take, finally this. And now we have rook, bishop, and six versus rook, bishop, and six. And Hans has the armada. He has the centralized phalanx of pawns. And he is going to just push them. Bishop h6, f4, rook goes to g8, it is targeting this pawn. Bilal plays g3. Hans shuts down the rook's invasion of the queen side. He's just controlling the game. I'm telling you, Hans's games are so fun. You know, they're always so exciting. Rook a3, defense, goes over here, takes, takes. Bishop g3, we're going to a rook end game. Rook and five, rook and five, buckle up. Here comes the c pawn. Asking the rook, is this going to stay on the b file or go sideways? It stays on the b file. Look at Hans defending from the side. He needs to keep pieces on the board. B3, watch, watch this move. Watch. A5. The idea is if rook c4, he's going to trade rooks. And despite being a pawn down in a king and pawn end game, he's faster to the pawns. And then he's going to eat the pawns. So instead of that, white goes here. Hans plays c3, taking away space from the white king. King e2, rook g3. Loses the pawn. And when the dust settles, these guys are down to three on three. And it is a race. And I'm telling you, this man makes things exciting. Rook b4 check. Rook c4 check. King goes here. b4. Very tough to say which pawn to move is better. Plays b4. Hans plays f5. It's a race. All right, it's a race. Five squares away from queening. One, two, three, four, five. Because you can't cross right now. Black. One, two, three, four. The best thing for white to do is apparently to play rook h4. And then after f4 check, rook h7, king e6, the rook stays back, anticipates the promotion, and it's, it's pandemonium. But apparently that's what he should do. Instead, he plays a4 right away. Now f4. Now the rook can't get out. Now a5. Now Hans sneaks down to the first rank. Uh-oh. Now the white rook is really in trouble because it's never going to be able to, to zigzag and get behind this pawn. So white continues to push. Rook a1 stops the advancement. b5. And that proves to be the losing mistake. Instead, apparently, king d2, rook a6, and b5. White had chances to hold the game. But when you get into this race, f3, b6, f2, rook c7 check. Wait a minute, king e6, b7, 
They queen at the same time. But Hans Niemann gets the first move with the new queen. And he plays queen f3 check. And Bilal resigns. Bilal resigns. Why does he resign? If you play king d2, it's rook d1 mate. If you play king b2, it's queen a3 mate. So you got to go forward. You go forward to one of these squares. I can win your queen. King b4, rook b1. And not to mention there are other mates. And if king c4, I have queen d5, queen d4, rook b1, and I take. Crazy. At, like, it was just rook and three versus rook and three with no time on the clock. The boys got into a race. And Bilal misjudges the end game and is losing and resigns. Now, things don't always go Hans' way. All right, he doesn't always play a Sicilian and get into a scrappy game and, and pulls it off. This game was nuts. And this is a budding rivalry. These guys played in January in um, the Tata Steel Challenger. So we might see a calendar year of these boys just battling it out constantly. Marc Andre is like 15, 16, 2600. Very, very good grandmaster. All the same things apply to Hansi, except he's like 20 and he's been 2700. Now, Marc Andre plays a. Karl Kahn, which is clearly an opening that still has a place among top-level chess players because it's a, it's a tough opening to crack. It's such a tough opening to crack. You got bozos doing stuff like this against it. I'm not even joking. This is a real line. It's a very popular line. This is called the Briar, the Briar, Briar for my Americans, uh, like the ice cream, right? <laughs> you, 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 yeah, yeah, we, we, we Americans, we, we like our ice cream for sure. That is, that is probably statistically proven. Um, Anyway, it's called the Breyer Variation. And um, the point is that White is like, I have no way to get an advantage against the Karo Khan because the greatest opening of all time. So I'm going to play this crap, and I'm going to trade the queens, lose the right to castle, and play this endgame. Yeah, like this is, this is how effective the Karo Khan is at top level. Um, and then after Black plays Knight F6, White plays this move Knight F to D2, undeveloping the Knight, blocking your bishop, and then defending your center. And this is, according to top-level chess, the meta. This is the meta. Uh, it's idiotic, and this is why top-level chess and noob-level chess just will never really intersect, because a person that has never played tennis can watch tennis and go, oh, you just swing the thing. With, yeah, you know, but no, be, no, this is idiotic. This is beyond idiotic. And the next move will surprise you even more. It's G5, okay? Like, I mean, I, again, like, this is... If you, if you let a 600 level player guess this position, not a single one of them would even go G5. It's beyond idiotic. It's so idiotic, it's brilliant. And that's the way top level chess works. You let an engine think for a little bit and the engine goes, well actually, because I cannot develop these pieces, I should probably play G5. And on the next move, white should play A4 and then black should play H5. <laughs> I can't explain this to you. Like, uh, there, there is no... The meta of the position is just effectively, because of the obscure structure and the unnatural setup, it's very difficult for black to make developing moves without getting attacked by white, so black just kind of arbitrarily takes a little bit of space. And so does white, right? Knight c3, bro plays h4, like, but clearly, based on the time spent, both guys know that this, they, these are the best moves, because they probably both analyzed this position. Uh, white now plays h3. Hans spends a little time, covers g4, and Marc Andre plays knight h5. So both guys are out of are out of prep, right? H4, h3. Black plays knight h5. The idea of knight h5 is uh, I have no idea what the idea of knight h5 is because you can't play knight g3. Maybe it's to play knight f4, but then you know, and and after knight f3, black plays f6. This might have been the idea all along. Just get a little connect four. And at this point, Marc Andre paused the clock and said, "I won." And then him and Hans Niemann had a little conversation because they realized they were actually at a chess tournament, not a uh, connect four tournament. Now the knight could either go there or route backwards. The other idea is, will black play e5, or does black not want to play e5, uh, or will actually Hans play e5 himself? Because Hans is the one that's like, I don't want black to play e5. Had I played bishop c4, black might have gone here and created a really, really powerful structure on that side of the board. I don't know. Haven't had a chance to talk to the players. e5. Now, black doesn't want to take. I hope we understand that because then you would be creating two weaknesses, right? So instead of that, black plays knight to d7. Hans plays a5. Just arbitrarily taking a little bit more space on that side. Wait, a5. a5. But what about this pawn? Yeah, it's all part of the plan. In fact, 
it's so valuable to white that black damages the... Oh, he damages the structure, but I guess white is going to be winning the pawn back on g5. Okay, well, that's really weird. Why did Marc Andrea give himself doubled isolated e pawns and a weak h pawn? I don't know. And the position is still equal because chess is an idiotic, fruitless time spend. And after you get to like a thousand, you should probably go play checkers, poker, connect four, battleship, Tetris, Catan, League of Legends, World of Warcraft, Overwatch, Rocket League. Literally any other game. Like, I, I don't I don't know what to tell you. Bishop f5 and black plays long castles with check. Hans Niemann, principled man, look, he saw rook a4 and he really liked it. King c1. You know what's funny? There's people in the chess world that don't even understand that reference. Look, I saw rook a4. Man, good times. The chess world has been through a lot. Anyway, white has six pawns, so does black. Uh, double D pawns and a weak H pawn, but what Marc Andrea has is he has a lot of open lines, and the open lines make the position okay for black and not terrible. Now he does in fact put the knight on f4. Uh, after take take, the pawn cannot be captured because your rook would be pinned to your king. Uh, by some miracle, Hans Niemann saw that and say, and played bishop 2e2 instead, and then knight e4. And now we get into a very complex endgame. Six pawns each. Bishop pair for black, rooks each. Uh, a very easy way to make a draw here would be to play take-take. And by make a draw, I mean suffer for a very long time because white has a little bit more activity. But again, opposite colored bishops, no winning chances for black. So black has an incentive to keep bishops on the board. Rookie won by Hans. Black plays rook g8, targeting that g2 pawn. Hans plays knight b3, going for a little walk with his horse. a6, preventing white from any advancement. King b1 arbitrary king slide out of the way, which happens in many types of positions. Rook to f8. Setting up, I suppose, a defense of this pawn by virtue of bishop c2 check. Rook e2. King c7. Bringing the king up one square, both sides kind of shuffling, poking at each other. Rook c4, okay. Bishop d6. All right. It's a shuffling game. You will notice Mark Andrea about 10 moves ago at 40 minutes on the clock and clearly is uncomfortable because all of a sudden, bro's got 3 versus 31. Hans has the easier position to play. Hans has the easier position to threaten stuff, overload Black's nervous system, and as you can tell, get him to 3 minutes, and constantly have him on the back foot and guessing. Now, Mark andrea is just losing the pawn. He didn't have to, he could have played rook f6. But, when you have low time, what you try to do is you try to force stuff. He's trying to get white to take his pawn, so that maybe he gets an end game that he can just hold, right? Because he's worse. And yeah, now Hans has all the benefits of the position, plus the extra pawn, plus a 25 minute time advantage. This has been a great game by Hans. Outmaneuvering his opponent, doing everything right, 34 seconds. Marc Andrea played this move with four seconds on the clock because he got 30 seconds back. So four plus 30 is 34, which is how I got to that number. I'm really smart in case you didn't know. Knight to f3. Going after the other weakness. Remember how a long time ago, a long time ago, I asked you, why did Marc Andrea get himself into this situation? Well, it turns out that Gotham Chess was right all along. Now, I'm right here. I would, you know, I wouldn't be right at the, at the tournament. Yeah, Black's in trouble. He's down upon. He's got huge weaknesses. He goes here. He's setting up like Rook D1 and, you know, various bishops are annoying. Plus, he's also attacking this pawn. Hans plays Rook A4. Bishop f7, threatening mate. Rook d1 is mate, by the way. Okay, no mate. Rook d5. And now Hans takes and goes for this endgame. Five pawns versus four. Still a big time advantage. And just like in that last game, when Hans had the majority on one side of the board, he just got him rolling. So he gets out of the way, and he gets him rolling. Now, if black could teleport the rook here, it would be mate. He can't do that, though, because that's not allowed. But he can threaten mate, right? That's a big threat. Yeah, but white just plays king c1, and the king could just defend, and... I don't know what you're going to do. Rook d5. Okay, I get it. All right, rook a5, but these guys are chess players. And they're going to stop each other. Now, Hans could play rook a4. He could just run the king. He just runs the king. Check here, rook a2. And now Hans is going to be in a situation where, rather than defending his pawn with his king, which would run into bishop g6, he gets exactly what he had in the last game. Remember the last game? Last game, all the pawns fell off the board. And that's exactly what's happening right now. 
Hans now has three pass pawns all on one side. He's going to push them. He just has to make sure nothing's happening over here. Look at this nice idea. Deflecting the bishop from the defense of the rook. Black has to play bishop to a1, win the bishop back. Now we have this position. There goes Hans. All right. He has a massive head start. And what other key difference is in this position? There's another difference. It's not just that his pawns are further ahead than black's pawns. What is the difference between white's position and black's position? Go fam! It's the bishop versus the knight! Shut up! No! Anybody can see that! Let's be a little bit more creative. It's the king. It's the fact that this king is so far away. There's no way black... And white's king is right here. White is in the square. This is the square. White's awaiting the other side to get into the square. So this is over. You got to be a little precise. Rook b2 check. King e3. Rook b3 check. They shuffle a little bit. Now he blocks. Rook a2. Hans already can consider playing h6. Just getting as close as possible. And getting to h7 as close as possible. And then playing rook of 8. Now, by the way, if bishop c3. King d3. Look at this. Take... You have check and h7, and it's completely winning. It's completely over, right? So it's completely winning. So he can already play h6, but he doesn't. Hans respects the pin. He plays king d1. That's what he didn't play h6. He was very close to queening, but he, you know, and now Mark andre is going to do all he can. He's going to play a5. Now Hans plays h6. Now we have a4. Now it's a question of do you send help or do you walk the pawn up to h7? We send help. We got two friends, and they're going to go side by side. And they're going to go promote. Black plays a3. But this is everything we talked about. The knight is there covering this. And the king is there. So now Hans just has to play knight b3. The bishop would, let's say, go to e5. Rook f5. The bishop would come here. g5. If rook b2 attacking the knight, g6. If rook b3, g7. And if a2, it's g8. And it's a fork. And you win. Okay? Now, if there's rook b1... King c2, a2, g8, and you win this. So, it's winning. You gotta calculate a little bit more, but then there's rook f8, and then there's g8. So you win. But instead of that, Hans plays g5. Okay. So he doesn't play knight b3. Now black goes here. Now Hans again... And this is perhaps the easiest win that he has. I'm not going to say I would have found it. I'm just saying he can go knight b3. And he's just pushing this g-pawn. Rook b2, g6. Rook b3, g7. You can't stop g8. You just win. Like, it's not even... There's check, and there's rook g1, but then there's rook f8. So, there's also king takes bishop, and then rook f8. Like, if you do it in the right order... You can't play king takes bishop here, or actually, you can. So, but for some reason, I mean, knight b3 is not that complicated. Like, I, I don't know. And he, but he goes here for some reason. All right, and now he's also got a minute. We just went from 30 minutes. No, no, even earlier. Even before all this, it was 31 to 3. And all of a sudden, we're deep in this endgame. And suddenly, Hans is like getting in his own head. He doesn't play knight b3. He plays g5. He doesn't play knight b3 again. Black plays bishop e5. And now Hans has one final moment. He can play rook f8 check. The king moves. Let's say the king goes to a7. And now he comes back. And the idea is that after he does this, he always has rook a5 check. So if bishop d4, he has rook a5. And if king b6, whatever, he keeps his rook on the a file. And then he pushes. And then he's winning. So he has this winning idea again. Instead of that, he plays g6. The idea is to sacrifice the rook and play g7. It makes sense. But black gives him check first. And now it's a question of where do you move your king? King c2, a2. I'm threatening rook c1 and a1 queen. Oh my goodness. And now it's too late to bring this back. Now it's too late. So now the best line that can happen is rook f8, king a7, king b3. You can't move your rook because I take the pawn. Rook h1, king a2, rook h6, draw, apparently, apparently. So rook a1 check, he's got to go toward the pawn. And for reasons I cannot fathom, he runs the other way. 
he goes the other way. So now instead of being closer to the pawn, finding this guy, I mean, king c2, king b3 is difficult. I get it. He plays king e2, and Marc Andre just goes here because it was the only damn idea that he had in the whole position was just to push the a pawn. Hans plays g7. Now his pawn is stopped, and black is queening. What just happened? Out of nowhere. Okay, I'm telling you, I get the position is tricky. I get time is low, but I am flabbergasted. Knight b3 and pushing the pawn to g8. Listen. I'm telling you, every game Hans plays is exciting. Like, I, I cannot, I, I don't know what he hallucinated. He just hallucinated because rook b2, g6, rook b3, g7 wins. Like, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what he saw. I don't know what spooked him. But this just wins. It's just winning. So, he didn't like this. He didn't like this concept. Maybe he didn't like something else here. Maybe he didn't like... Uh, King C, I don't know, maybe he, but, you know, he, like, maybe he saw, he, he didn't see a win here. I don't know. Maybe he didn't like this. I don't know. All I know is, now the position is winning for black. Hans plays knight g3. Black queens. Hans queens with check. Normally when you queen with check, you begin the attack. But there's no more checks. The rook is hanging. And more importantly, the king is hanging. Queen c4, trying to give up the rook, but queen d1, rook e1, that's gg. That is just gg. The king is completely surrounded, knight e2, Marc Andrea goes here, and this is a completely winning position because Hans resigned. Because if he had gone here, black would have went here deflecting the king from the queen, and then they would have traded, and then this, and this is just a completely winning endgame because you have two pawns. And the bishop covers. It's winning without that as well. But it's, yeah, it's winning. And that is crazy. I don't know how, like, Hans is just, he, he, I, I, I don't know. I would love to be in the mind of Hans. Because this game was so well done. And then he just, he just had to play knight b3. And I don't know why he didn't like this move. I don't know what he didn't see. But black wins from, you know, four mistakes in a row, basically. And I, I guess it all sort of started like here. He played uh, g5, which was slightly inaccurate. Then he played knight e4, which was a mistake. And then he played g6, which was a mistake. And then he played here, which straight up just lost the game. Here was maybe his last moment. Instead of g7, he could have played rook g4. With the idea, rook e1 check, taking, allowing a queen and then running the king there, and white is not lost. <laughs> this was his final moment. He could have put the rook here, but he didn't, and I, yeah, I, just, I don't know. Just like a total, total meltdown. And when Hans plays, like, this is just exciting. I mean, it's not, you know, win or lose. I'm just, I'm just here to provide the entertainment. Like, this man, kill or be killed, is the style of Hans Neiman. And he is always looking for a fight. And I think Marc Andrea has now beaten him twice in two months, if I'm not mistaken. So this is a very fun developing rivalry. Uh, hopefully these games were exciting. I will, of course, cover Hans, uh, whether he wins or loses. And I have never seen somebody so polarizing. When I cover Hans, the comment section is like 50-50 at each other's throats. You guys are like never cover any of his events, and the other half are like, yeah, let's go Hans. Like, this is, this is hilarious, okay? And I'm gonna continue to cover his games when he plays. So, that's all I have for you today. I don't know what Hans' next event is, but uh, you know the drill. Get out of here.